to maximise the presentation, which... Ah, there we go. Yep, you're good to go, Clive. Okay, um, so I'm Dr Clive Fox. So I'm based at the Scottish Association of Marine Science, and I've been involved with uh, the electrofishing issue, particularly for the razor clams in, around Scotland for the last few years. Um, and I also recently uh, attended an ICES working group, WG Electra, uh, which was looking at the more about the uh, the pulse fishery in the Southern North Sea. So I'm going to say a bit about that as well. For those of you, any of you who don't know um, the lab in in Oban, um, we're based at Dunbeg, which which is close to Oban um, on this little peninsula here very beautiful spot and if any of you haven't come to visit us I, I'd encourage you to, to come across at some point when restrictions are, are lifted and, and enjoy enjoy our institute. So the talk today I want to <clears throat> cover a little bit about what electrofishing is uh, for those of you who may not be familiar and then move on to a bit about the razor clam biology and the Scottish trial. And I'm then going to describe some work we've done developing survey techniques for, for the razor resource, present a few results from the Clyde and a little bit of preliminary results from the Firth of Forth. The fishery, as most other fisheries in, in Scotland has been quite heavily impacted by the coronavirus. So I'll, I'll say a little bit about that and then wrap up with some concluding remarks and, and then try and answer people's questions. So what is electrofishing? It's, well, it's fairly obviously it, it's using electricity as, as a means of, of fishing. So either stunning organisms or, or stimulating them to emerge from the seabed um, where they can be collected um, by some sort of fisheries device. So it was, it was quite interesting, um, the early experiments with marine electrofishing actually took place in the 1940s um, by some German researchers, but it was never really developed at that time into a sort of commercial uh, technique. And that was really because of issues around um, being able to produce enough power um, to, to work in a marine environment. So a lot of you are probably familiar with electrofishing in, in freshwater. I mean, it's, it's widely used there, um, particularly as a surveying technique in rivers. And it doesn't, it, it, the interest, it, it's much less widely used in, in the marine environment. But as I say, there, there is a history um, of, of it. And after the 40s, it, it pretty much was ignored, really, apart from a few sort of minor developments. Um, it is used, for example, in, in China, um, in inshore areas. And the real developments, I guess, began to take place in the sort of 1990s um, in the Southern North Sea and, and the Dutch industry in particular. Um, began to experiment with electrofishing as, as a way really of, of collecting sole, common sole, solea, solea. And it was driven really by increases in fuel prices. So, so when the, the oil prices went up very, very heavily, there was a lot of interest in more fuel efficient methods of fishing. So the bottom left picture you can see a traditional chain map beam trawl. So I took that picture in, in sort of 2010, so about uh, 10 years ago. And since then, nearly all the, the beam trawlers have converted over to the, the pulse gear, um, which is shown on the right. And the difference really is that the heavy chain map that you can see on the left here is now replaced with these strings of, of electrodes and those are where the electrical stimulation comes from. Going to be talking 
later on in the talk more about the razor clam fishery and i mean it's important to note um, that there is actually quite large differences between the false straw fishery and and the razor clam fishery in, in we'll, we'll have a look at that in a sec so the razor clam the the rig is, is much smaller um, essentially it's uh, a series of electrodes um, which are connected to a spreader bar which is towed along behind the vessel and the razor clams are normally picked up uh, by a diver one or two divers swimming along behind behind the electrodes and I'll I'll go into a bit more detail about how the gear is deployed um, in, a, in a few slides time there's also quite big differences in the electrical stimulation as well so the pulse trolls use something called a, a PVC, a pulsed bipolar current. And this is quite short pulses of, of stimulation. So this is a, a trace here of, of the pulse beam and 160 microseconds positive and then and then negative and then quite a long gap before the next the next pulse. There are slight differences. Um, there's two main makes of, of pulse gear trill fishery that have been used and, and they've got slight differences in in the pulse characteristics the difference though with the razor fishery is that the razor fishery is essentially using a continuous alternating current and so there's no there's no gap in the stimulation and amps and voltitudes so the voltage is 50, about 50 volts in the pulsatural fishery and, and 24 volts in, in the razor clam fishery. Um, the current loads, you can see it's it's lower in the pulsatural fishery, about 10 amps on the electrodes, 60 amps on the razor clam fishery. But the separation of the electrodes is, is wider in the razor clam fishery. So you need more current to actually get a get a signal across there. So I've just summarized here um, the main differences between the pulse trawl and the razor clam. Um, so they're both uh, fishing on similar sort of seabed type, sandy to, to muddy sand. Um, but the pulse trawl fishery is operating in, in deeper water. The razor clam fisheries very shallow. I mean, it's typically less than about 10 meters depth. And that's really determined by both where most of the razor clams are found, but they tend to be in the quite shallow inshore areas, but also by um, the saturation time for, for diving, scuba diving with air. Um, once you go below these sort of depths, you, you start getting limited in terms of how long you can stay down. The pulse trawl fishery is generally operated by quite large trawlers, similar to the ones that, that I showed in the photo earlier on. But the razor clam fishery is, is much smaller um, inshore, inshore vessels. Difference in the stimulation, as we described before. So the pulse bipolar current versus continuous AC. Um, bit of a difference in the voltages and currents and so on. The, the duty cycle you can see there is the percentage of time that the electrical stimulation is on. So I mentioned earlier on that the, the PVC currents very short pulses and then a gap. So in fact, the stimulation is only on for around about 2% of the time. Whereas with the continuous AC, it's pretty much a hundred percent. Towing speeds are quite different as well. So the pulse trawl fishery is reasonably really fast, 2.4 up to about five knots. The razor clam fishery is very, very slow. And the result of that is that the exposure time of organisms to the electrical stimulus is, is very different. So with the pulse trawl, it's less than a couple of seconds. Whereas with the razor clam, you're talking about up to a minute minute and a half perhaps exposure time. Collection of the organisms. So 
obviously with the pulse trawl, it's a trawl. So the fish are caught in the cod end and hauled on board and then, and then sorted. And the razor clams typically are collected by divers. That has some implications for the discards. So those organisms that are not, not wanted uh, for whatever reason. So with the pulse trawling, it, it's the usual sort of sorting the catch on board and uh, discarding of material. Obviously some implications for the EU discards ban there, landing obligation. Uh, whereas with the razor clams, the small animals, which are, are not worth collecting, are just left on the, on the seabed. And I'll, I'll say something about sort of recovery of, of the organisms later on. Difference in the, the markets as well. So most of the sole is used in Europe, um, but some's processed for export. But the razor clam fishery is, is really now nearly all um, exported live to the Far East. And of course, with coronavirus, that, that's had um, some additional implications for the fishery. Values, um, so declared landings in, and this is just for uh, the sole catch by the Netherlands postural fishery, um, about eight and a half thousand tonnes in, in 2018, the last official figures, and the razor clam about 550 tonnes from Scotland. So razor clams are also harvested in Ireland, but they are using hydraulic dredges mainly. And value, um, I converted the value from euros to pounds, um, about 25 million for the sole catch and about four and a half million or so for the razor clams. So one thing that the electro fisheries have, have certainly had in common is they're quite controversial. And this goes back really to Article 31 of the EU Common Fisheries Policy, which talks about unconventional fishing methods. So they ban things like explosives, use of poisons, but also electric current. And this was then amended by some other regulations to allow essentially what was called an experimental pulse fishery in, in the Southern North Sea. And it has been quite controversial. So there was a, an organization called Bloom, an NGO set up, um, as far as I understand, mainly in France, and really oppos opposed to, to the Dutch postural fishery. And there's various arguments that have been raised around the fishery. Um, Yep, some quite emotive language. Uh, our friend George Monbiot, for example, slaughtering sea life in the name of science and, and comparing the pulse fishery um, in the article to the Japanese whaling for research. And even reached science, um, so got quite high up in the scientific literature. And it was even invoked in the Brexit, so fishing for leave. And um, there's actually a, a YouTube clip of Nigel Farage interviewing a, a fisherman from somewhere in England complaining about the, the Dutch postural fishery destroying all the fish um, in, in the English waters. So the upshot of all this was um, that the European Parliament approved uh, a ban on electro fishing or confirmed the electric fishing ban. And so there was a new regulation that's come in and effectively this is going to phase out the, the pulse trawl fishery in the Southern North Sea uh, by I think June 2021 is, is when it's supposed to be phased out. So essentially it will go back to using the old chain map beam trawls, I'd imagine, for catching the sole, un unless um, any sort of appeal, for example, goes through, goes through the parliament. So there's been quite a lot of recent research to try and address some of the scientific concerns raised 
around the, the false draw fishery. And this was reviewed recently by IC's WG Electra and a report issued. And you can download that report from the IC's website and, and have a, a look at all the details if, if you're interested. There's quite quite a lot of writing on this slide and I just tried to sort of summarize um, the results of, of the review of the scientific evidence. So there doesn't seem to be from experimental work um, any evidence that the pulse trawl causes direct mortality of fish and invertebrates, but spinal injuries do occur in, in some fish but it, it's at quite low rates. It does seem cod, particularly larger cod, are a bit more prone to those, to those injuries. Um, however, as, as part of the, the work, the population level in, impacts of, of that exposure were, were worked up and, and turned out to be, be very, very small at, at the population level. And that's a result really of the relatively low numbers of, of larger cod that would ever encounter a pulse trawl. So people also get very worried when you mention electricity um, about electroreceptive species. So these are mainly the elasma branks. However, physiologically, they're more sensitive to the low frequency direct current and they don't really seem to respond to, to the high frequency pulse current. There's also been some work done looking at the effects on benthic invertebrates and they seem to return to normal behavior as far as one can tell in, in less than an hour after exposure. It's definitely true that the pulse trawls have less mechanical impact on the seabed than conventional beam trawling and that's just because the gear is, is that much lighter. And there's also a slightly lower towing speed compared with the beam trawls. And the original reason, I guess, the gear was, was developed was really pushed forward by, as I said, the fuel prices. And there seems to be a, a reduction in fuel consumption of about 50% if you scale it to uh, the, each unit of, of sole quota that, that's caught. So as uh, reduced CO2 emissions from the pulse trawls. And there's also some evidence that the pulse trawls are more selective, the sole, so less, less bycatch. However, there has been a bit of a spatial shift in the fishing effort, and, and that's because the pulse trawls can work over slightly muddier ground uh, than typically you would, you would use the chain map beam trawl for. And perhaps the issue that's driven um, the campaign, if you like, as far, as far as one can tell, is that there's a differential favoring, if you like, for, for the larger vessels. And a lot of these larger vessels are in the Netherlands fleet, whereas a lot of the vessels in, in the French and the English fleet are rather smaller. And there's a significant investment needed for postural gear, around about 300,000 euros to, to set up and I think that is probably what's driven quite a lot of the, the disputes around the, the pulse fishery in, in the Southern North Sea. Um, and as I say, the, the arguments um, have been accepted by the European Parliament and the pulse fishery is, is due to be phased out. So moving back on to the razor clam fishery, a little bit more detail. Um, so it's generally uh, three pairs of brass electrodes being towed behind the boat. And these electrodes are about two meters long. And as I said, 24 volts to each electrode pair, which results in about 50 to 80 uh, amps at the electrodes. That sounds quite dramatic, but to be honest, if, if a diver's in the water, they, they can just about detect the field if, if they're right up by the electrodes. So, that, so they perhaps feel a very slight uh, tingling. And generally um, less than 15 meters. So we can see um, gear set up on, on the right here. 
So this is actually from some of the earlier Marine Scotland trials. So there's a, a frame on the left-hand side holding a camera, which wouldn't normally be there. And the towing vessel is, is pulled along by winding in the anchor cable and just proceeding really at a sort of slow walking pace. If you go too fast, of course, the divers can't keep up with it. And also there won't be enough time for the animals to, to come out of the sediment. You just see a collection bag on the left as well that, that the diver would be putting the razor clams into as, as they pick them up. So how's the fishery developed? Um, originally, there was a little bit of collection uh, going on sort of in the 1990s, uh, maximizing, you know, a couple of hundred tons. And the market was, was quite different then. It was being shipped down mainly to Spain and Portugal. And things began to change really in the, the early 2000s when a market in the Far East began to develop. So the animals are being flown live out to the Far East, so mainly through from Scotland anyway, through Glasgow Airport. And it became really quite a valuable fishery. And one of the real problems was, well, what uh, methods are being used to actually collect this, this uh, amount of razor clams? So at the time, electro fishing was illegal, and the official estimate of the split was that about 87% were being caught by, by hand. And supposedly, this is using a technique called salting, where the divers would take down brine, pour it down the holes, and that encourages the razor clams to come out and they pick them up. To be honest, talking to various people it, and looking at that amount of harvest weight, it's very, very unlikely that this was really what was going on. Um, and it's much more likely that the bulk of that catch was being caught by electro fishing. So, again, the press, um, you know, being quite vociferous. Again, you know, it's quite an emotive thing, I guess, if you talk about electricity and, and sticking it into the marine environment, people get quite irate. And we had articles like celebrity chefs demand clamp down on illegal electrocution of shellfish. Well, okay, the shellfish really are actually not being electrocuted, but we'll, we'll come on to that in a minute. And there was articles in the Herald. Um, and the real issue, so this was in 2015, it was around sort of illegality of this fishery, um, various people getting involved who one would perhaps not wish to be involved in, in a, in a well-managed fishery. So a little bit of background um, on, on the organisms themselves before I'll go on to sort of talk about the, the razor clam trial in a bit more detail. And there's two commercial species, Ensis siliqua and, and Ensis magnus, it used to be called Arcuatus, but, but they changed the name a couple of years ago. And siliqua is the main target for the, the fishery, for the export market, because these animals are, are larger. And you can see um, some examples on the right here, um, bundled up and, and ready to be sold or, or exported. So there is a minimum legal landing size in the EU uh, for all razor fish of 10 centimeters. And there isn't a huge amount of, of growth data available at the moment. There are some historical estimates from, from Ireland and they would therefore suggest that uh, Ensis siliqua is gonna take about three or four years to reach the minimum landing size. However, the, the best price for them is, is a larger size, so around about 15 centimetres. So we're probably talking up to nine years or so to reach that size. 
After that, the growth begins to slow. And the densities uh, where the razor clams occur at sufficient densities to make them commercially viable for harvesting, they're quite restricted in, in the area. So, so sort of relatively small patches of suitable sand. And it's that spatial concentration that potentially can attract fishes into a restricted area and, and perhaps lead to a rather rapid resource depletion. And, and that's especially true if a new technique for fishing emerges um, that's, that's quite efficient and, and electrofishing does seem to be quite an efficient harvesting method. So as I say, the, the whole technique sort of emerged in the early 2000s and um, came to the attention of, of Marine Scotland and Marine Scotland Science. And so there were some early studies conducted, um, one by Mike, Mike Breen and co. And they were sort of looking at what the, the impacts might be of, of the electrofishing. And it's important to note that that early work was done using a direct current DC system. So it, it's not quite so relevant uh, to the AC systems, which, which are used, used at the moment. But they concluded that the technique can produce good yields of, of high quality animals and that it potentially had lower impacts on other organisms and the benthic habitat compared particularly with, with the hydraulic dredge technique. So the concerns really around the emerging fishery are linked to its high efficiency and also people worrying about the effects of electricity on non-target and, and wider ecosystem effects. So how, how does it actually work? It, it's not entirely clear, um, but ENSYS normally will burrow very rapidly down into the sediment using a muscular foot. And when they're exposed to electricity or other stimulus like uh, pouring the brine, for example, into the burrows, it's probably an escape reaction. So this is again different to the Southern North Tree Sea pulse trawl fishery, where a pulse there is causing a muscle cramp in the sole and, and causing the animals to bend up into a U shape, which means that they're caught easier in the trawl then. So some of the video um, shows that the Ensis will naturally move around on, on the seabed and they'll recover quite quickly from exposure to the electric current and start moving around. So, so this is why it's thought that this is a, a sort of escape reaction rather than a, a physio physiological um, muscle response to, to the electrical stimulation. So Fiona Murray and, and some other colleagues at Marine Scotland Science then did um, some updated work and had a look at the commercial AC system. So rather than the DC system that was used in the earlier work. And they also actually went into the field and did some work um, using some of the commercial vessels. And again, produced a, a report where they, they exposed various organisms in, in a tank situation as shown in the top here um, to a simulated exposure and then looked at their recovery. And most uh, organisms seem to recover as far as they could tell fairly well and resume normal behavior. And what they weren't able to look at was really sort of longer term effects. So, so this was sort of short term recovery. So there was a consultation held by Marine Scotland in whether people thought that electrofishing should be investigated further as, as a, a technique. And the upshot of that consultation was the establishment of this experimental trial fishery in Scotland. So this operates under a, a derogation, um, so, so it's legal. And um, the areas, so, so there are sort of 11 areas which have been defined. So these were, were picked 
based on the, the habitat and the likelihood of razor clams being present. Area four was uh, not used because it's part of the Barra SAC and, and SNH were concerned about impacts in there. And the other thing it's very important to realize is that the actual harvest areas within these bigger purple areas are actually quite small. So the other piece of control legislation that shellfish harvesting has to abide by is, is the hygiene regulations. And there are prescribed shellfish harvest areas, which are monitored by the Food Standards Agency. And this is in relation to potential contamination of the shellfish, um, particularly from terrestrial sources of, of sewage, for example. So there's a number of areas. Um, so this is an example from the Firth of Clyde. So, so the big sort of yellow hatched area is the derogation area where the trial fishery would be allowed to take place. But the harvest areas are actually much smaller. So, so this is one that is active at the moment. These other ones are being tested or were being tested before the coronavirus outbreak um, to see if, if they water quality is, is sufficiently good to allow harvesting from them. You can also harvest shellfish from grade two waters. So grade one being, being the best, but grade two waters you can harvest from, but you then have to put the shellfish through a process um, of, of depuration, which is keeping them in, in filtered clean water for a period of time to allow any contaminants to, to clear out of the system. So this bit really is about protecting um, human consumers from any, any pathogens. And this bit is, is about the experimental control of the, the fishery in an experimental way. So already mentioned um, that the trials avoiding sensitive habitats. So, so this is where SNH come in, or I think they've changed their name recently now to Nature Scott. Um, the shellfish production waters, that's monitored by the Food Standards Agency, so Food Standards Scotland. And there's a limited number of licensed vessels in, in the trial fishery. So if, you, if you're not licensed within this fishery, then you're not allowed to harvest razor clams. So the licensed vessels in, in the trial, they have to have an electronic position monitoring system that provides very detailed positioning information. And that's quite unusual in the inshore fisheries. And, and it's something that's actually proving very useful in terms of understanding um, the behavior of, of the fleet over time. There's also a daily catch limit set by Marine Scotland Science Advice um, they have to report data in quite a detailed manner. Um, so haul by haul amounts that they're, they're, they're catching. And the industry are also asked to assist with, with sampling. So, so they've been sending samples to Marine Scotland Science, for example, and also um, helping with the surveys that are directly taking place on the ground. So I think what we, what we all want is, is a sort of science-based sustainable fishery and, and that needs quite a lot of, of information. So biological information, so growth rates and maturity, um, assessment of the resource on the ground is, is very useful, particularly if, if it's a fishery independent assessment data from the boats on fishing effort, how that's changing in space and time. So, so that's coming from the data, they, the catch records they have to, have to report. And interactions of, of the fishery with wider ecosystem components has become increasingly important over time. And all of this needs effective cooperation with the industry. So in the next few slides, I want to say a little bit more about some work we've been doing looking at the assessment of the, re the resource. 
So a few years ago, we began to experiment with Toad video. So, so this is a, a system that we built a rig. It has three downward looking video cameras and we tow that behind the electrofishing rig. The video signal is fed up onto the boat and so we can monitor it live so we can see what's going on and that, that's proven very useful. And it's just towed along behind the electrofishing vessel in, in the normal manner. So this is from a forward looking camera from the rig and you can just see some of the razor clams have emerged onto the seabed and one of them is moving around, others are static. One of them on the right hand side has just emerged and, and laid down and then it <coughs> pops back up again so they do recover from the electrical stimulation. And they will rebury after a few minutes as well. You do sometimes see small flatfish um, stunned on the ground, and there's a crab walking across. Doesn't seem to be at all bothered by what's what's going on. And there's a little bit of disturbance to, to the seabed, just just the, the drag marks of, of the beam and, and the bars, but, but really not too much. So this is video, <coughs> a screenshot from the downward looking cameras. So there's three cameras with over, overlapping fields of vision. So we stitch those together after we've corrected them for camera distortion because there's a bit of a fisheye effect. And you can see the, the towing speeds quite slow. And the width of the, the three images stitched together is a meter and a half wide. So, so effectively you're getting a, a swath along the tow path from which we can calculate the, the swept area. And having done all that pre-processing, we then need to measure the animals. So we've calibrated these images um, in the lab using known size targets. And then we can review the video using another bit of software. And one of my colleagues has the, the joy of, of sitting and watching all the videos and, and stopping it and, and measuring it, all of the razor clams. We've done a little bit of comparison of um, <coughs> the video reconstructed size frequencies um, against samples collected by diver. And this is a couple of examples of that. So the video reconstructions on the, the left here and here, this is the equivalent dive sample that's being collected. And the modes of the sizes agree reasonably well. What doesn't agree is that on the video you see a lot more smaller razor clams. And we think this is because although we asked the diver to collect all the razor clams that, that they could see, they're trained to, to pick up larger animals for, for market. And, and so there's a, a selectivity going on in the material collected by, by the divers. So anyway, we were fairly happy with that result and um, we use the video reconstruction as an indication now of the, the size range of, of razor clams in an area. So those initial results and development of the technique were published in a Marine Scotland Science report. And we then went out into the field and did 
some surveys in the Firth of Clyde in 2017. And the conclusions of this was really that um, we seem to have fairly low abundances of Ensis Siliqua along those sites along the air coast. Now it's difficult to know whether those abundances, those densities are atypical. They seem to be lower than what we were seeing when we developed the technique um, in the Outer Hebrides. And there's not very much historical data to compare new data with, which is another problem. So Houghton in 2007 did survey one of the areas that overlapped our area and was recording densities of about five per meter squared, but that was using a suction dredge. So potentially a gear effect difference as, as well, maybe. There's also perhaps a bit of an effect of towing speed on, on clam emergence. Um, that needs more testing, but it doesn't seem that likely based on more recent results that that factor led to rather low clam densities in the air coast. But there is anecdotal evidence that, that sites along that coast have been quite heavily fished historically, so, so it could be a fishery effect. This year, we managed to get out into Largo Bay, which is in the Firth of Forth, and this is another of the, the harvest areas in the trial. And the impression that we had there, the, the data is still being worked on and analysed, but the impression from looking at the videos on the boat was that there's quite high densities of razor clams in this location. And this Largo Bay area has been fished pretty, pretty well for, for a good number of years. So it may be then that differences between this site and the sites on the air coast actually reflect differences in, in productivity as well. It was an interesting um, aside was that um, there seems to be an increase in Ida ducks in Largo Bay. So the photo in the bottom, I took off the, the back of the fishing boat and I counted up to 100 Ida duck um, at any one time. Not, not always behind the boat, but sometimes. And they're definitely taking um, some of the, the razor clams that are being uh, forced onto the seabed by the electro fishing. And, and we even caught some on, on our cameras picking up razor clams. So that's a, an interesting sort of side effect um, on, a, on a sort of top predator that, that we hadn't really even thought about before we went out and did this bit of field work. So that data is currently being analysed and worked up and, and will be produced as a, a Marine Scotland report, hopefully in the autumn. So COVID, yes, it's obviously had, had a big effect on, on this fishery, as on a lot of other fisheries in Scotland. So the main market is, is China, and in January to February this year, the markets shut down, and, and that was quite a sudden, a sudden stop. And the markets then actually began to reopen a bit in, in sort of February, April. But the problem that the fishery then encountered was finding export flights because the number of flights out of Glasgow airport had dropped dramatically and so they weren't able to actually export the product in any in any sort of same quantities as, as they were usually exporting. Some of those export flights have now picked up but another problem has occurred and that is that the, the shellfish testing by the Food Standards Agency has stopped because presumably the Food Standards Agency labs have all been put across onto coronavirus testing. And so they can't now um, get a safety, a health safety certificate for, for the product. So the result of all these difficulties is that the fishery is stopped now until at least the 15th of June. How quickly it will pick up after that remains to be seen.
but I think it's a, it's a good illustration of the, the complexity and the global nature of some of these fisheries now um, that you've got all these different steps involved from logistics, the markets, the, the export, the transport, but also testing uh, within the UK as well and certification and all those sorts of issues. So where are we going next? Um, so we're hoping to do more surveys in the Firth of Forth. As I say, part of it, Largo Bay area, we managed to complete before the lockdown. Um, hopefully we can get back out and do some more surveying later in the year. Repeat surveys in the harvest areas every few years, I think would be very desirable to, to monitor the, the changes in, in the uh, resource on the ground, but that depends on, on future funding. Most of the work so far has been funded by the EU through European Maritime Fisheries Fund, and, and we're not quite sure what may replace that um, once um, that funding stops. Growth rates of clams in the different fishery areas is, is of interest because there seems to be perhaps indications of maybe some differences in productivity. And so we've got a PhD student starting in October who will be looking at that as what part of their project. And also trying to have a look at some of these uh, medium to longer term ecosystem impact concerns that, that people raise. But I think the, the story from the southern, or the lessons from the, the southern North Sea, the postural fishery, um, is that it's not just about the scientific data. And, and you can have re really quite rigorous scientific results. It doesn't necessarily mean that the fishery is going to be supported by the wider stakeholders. There's, there's often other issues there, it's, and it can be quite emotive. And we, I think we have to be sensitive to those concerns and, and to try and address those concerns. And the media, yeah, the media generally are, are not very supportive of, of electrofishing. And part of that was particularly about around the illegality of the, the thing before the, the actual trial was put in place. Um, but, it, but it's also perhaps not really understanding um, the science around, around the fishery as well. So thank you very much for listening. Um, acknowledgements, of course, um, definitely all the skippers, crew, who've taken part in the surveys and sharing their local knowledge has been really, really helpful. Lars Brunner uh, at SAMS, Razor Clam Association for help with the surveys and some people in Marine Scotland and Marine Scotland Science who've been particularly helpful in, in the whole project. And there are some references at the back if people are interested in reading more about this. So thank you very much for listening and happy to try and answer any questions people have now. Thanks for your talk. Um, if you can just pull up the Q&A, that would be really helpful so we can work through that. I am just going to change screens for everyone. And um, if anyone has any questions uh, that they haven't already submitted, please use the Q&A box that is below uh, your screens where Clive and I are. Uh, you can submit it in there. If you're watching on YouTube, you can alternatively ask the question in the chat that is just to the right of the video that you're watching right now. So let's work through some of these questions. Um, so our first question comes in, and I think you already answered this in your talk, Clive. Uh, it was just quite a quick one saying, do the razors actually recover and rebury if they're not harvested? And I think that one of the videos you showed, uh, like they came back up and I think you mentioned that they do rebury after a little bit of time. Yes, you, 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 you definitely, they do. Um, I suppose the question is, is whether there's any longer term negative impacts on them. And, and that's something that still needs to be looked at. But, but certainly um, they seem to recover and, and rebury in the, shorter, in the short term anyway. Mm -hmm. And from the same uh, 
person. Uh, the next question is, are there any formal studies of the potential influence slash impacts on a Lazarus Franks, for example, that are sensitive to electromagnetic stimuli? Even though very low levels of electromagnetic stimulus may affect elasmobranch behavior over reasonable wide areas. I think the answer to that is, is yes. There's been quite a lot of work done on elasmobranch responses, both um, to the postural fishery and to things like cables um, around for, for offshore renewables. And... I think you've got to be quite careful about generalizing because uh, as, as I'd indicated, you know, the reaction of, of organisms to the electrical stimuli is very dependent on the type of stimulus you're giving. And mm -hmm. so the, the work on the Southern North Sea, um, where they, they looked at whether a variety of, of elasmobranchs would respond to the pulse trawl didn't show any any real reactions at all and and this is as i say this is is thought to be because you know the the fish are sensitive to a different frequency of, of electrical stimulation okay and uh regarding your trial um actually no this question goes with how many licensed vessels uh are there in the fishery fishery so um I guess this yeah, is so, so how many I mean, there are in actually in Scotland yeah, yeah. in the razor clam fishery itself. So, I mean, I must point out that the fishery trial is run by Marine Scotland, and at SAMS, we're um, helping out with some of the science and, and collecting data. We, we, we're not responsible for the administration of the, of the trial, that, that's a government trial. Um, but there, there's 22 vessels uh, licensed in the trial. Mm -hmm. And uh, the next question was, how was the decision taken on which vessels would receive these licenses? So I assume there was some current criteria uh, which enabled them to uh, yeah. achieve the license. Yeah, so, so there was quite a, a long list of criteria which people can download off the Marine Scotland website if, if you search or, or if you, if you can email me and I could, could send you a copy. Um, there was a lot of criteria around uh, the vessel safety, um, whether, it was, whether it could carry the specified electro-stimulation electro gear. So there's a lot of... Um, it's quite tightly defined, you know, the sizes of the electrode rods and the material they have to be made of and the power generation and so on. They also have to have a health and safety inspection. And they have to be willing, as I said, to carry the electronic monitoring equipment, which gives a very detailed picture of where they're actually operating. Um, they have to be willing to submit all that, the data, um, the landings data and so on. And there has been, I think, one or two vessels that have been thrown out of the trial for infractions, legal infractions. But generally, I think the, um, there seems to be good compliance with, with the rules in the trial so far. And I think our next question you also answered during your talk, how did you decide on what daily quota to allow? You said that this was actually decided uh, through previous analysis by Marine Scotland. That's right. Yeah, I mean, it. it yeah, I, I. It's not me that would decide the quota. Mm -hmm. And uh, did you have to carry out assessments in terms of the impacts of the fishery on protected habitats and birds, for example, within SACs or SPAs? Yeah, that was that was done again by Marine Scotland um, mm -hmm. as part of the process of deciding where those experimental areas were going to be. And for example, I mentioned that the, the, the proposed area around Barra ended up not being taken forward um, because of, of concerns that that was within an SAC. 
I'm just aware of time. Uh, just to let everyone know that um, this whole session will be re is recorded. So if you've got a question that we haven't yet answered, but you need to scoot off, don't worry, it will get answered eventually and will be uploaded onto our YouTube page. Clive, are you okay to stick around to answer a few more questions? Yes, no, not a problem. Okay, great. Um, so swiftly moving on to the next question, it was this fishery has shown to have the value um, of electronic monitoring. Uh, has shown the value of actually electronic monitoring, sorry, I should say, uh, can have both for compliance and for science. Uh, what future do you think electronic monitoring has in providing data, particularly for science, so not just watching, like how can it help science and I guess fisheries management? Yeah, I think, I mean, I think the, the problem we've always had with particularly these inshore fisheries is, is knowing exactly where they're taking place and this sort of electronic monitoring data is, is absolutely invaluable and the problem we've always encountered from the science side is the rules around confidentiality so so these data tend to be collected um, as part of legal compliance which is a, a different department in marine scotland and, and also a different department within defra down south and actually getting hold of this data for science analysis can be quite challenging, actually. Um, usually one can get around it by anonymization. So vessel IDs and so on are taken away. Um, but in some of these fisheries where there's only a few vessels fishing in an area, you could work out which vessel it was from the data. And then they're quite reluctant to sort of release that data into anything like the public domain. So I, th I think there are real issues around confidentiality that need addressing somehow. And if we could somehow make the data more accessible, that would be extremely useful. Understood. Um, with uh, the ongoing fishery itself, uh, how is it understood the impact of its sustainability of the fishery in all of those licensed areas is our next question oh that's that's a tricky one um <laughs> <laughs> i think it's probably a bit too early to to know the answer to that um again it, it uh, from the landings information and and really this is a question again from marine scotland science um most of the areas seem to be holding up in terms of their their yields, but we haven't done repeat surveys in most of those areas yet. Okay, I see we have someone who has their hand up, uh, Malcolm. So if you're happy, I'm just going to try and unmute Malcolm and he might be able to ask a question actually over the line. So uh, we'll just give this a... Might be a couple of seconds in delay. Ooh. Malcolm? Hello, Malcolm. I think he has his microphone muted. Oh, oh, there we go. He should be able to speak. Okay. Yeah, in terms of uh, yeah, the dual purpose of monitoring, um, I think a major part of the Marine Scotland's work just now, they call it project modernization of the inshore fleet. So every vessel will have some form of electronics relaying information back. And it is to be hoped that uh, the opportunity would arise for uh, biological data as well as positions and things. So yeah, I think everybody's thinking about it. So it's just a matter of time and getting it right when that comes about. Yes. Yeah, so, so, I mean, on the sort of wider issue of, of sort of, you know, monitoring across the inshore fleet more widely, um, there's a program which was run through MARS called CIFIDS, which, which finished recently. Um, and that was, was looking at some of these different types of uh, monitoring equipment you could put on inshore vessels and all the problems of you know getting data back from potentially remote areas where there isn't always good uh, mobile phone coverage, for example. Great, thank you very much. Thank you, Malcolm. And 
moving on to our next question, which I think is looking for a bit of gossip. Any out and out illegal activity going on? <laughs> Not that I've seen. That's good to know. <laughs> That's about all. Uh, yeah. <laughs> you always hear anecdotes of, of course, in the pub. But um, yeah, I, I haven't seen any. Mm -hmm. Our next question, which I'm going to read out from our, our, one of our YouTube videos, uh, video, uh, viewers, is, is there, is there going to be fishing intensity trials or multiple trials according to each study site? Or is this going to be looked at as a part of the super DTP PhD? So I, I think we're hoping that that will be part of the, the super DTP. Um, mm -hmm. And what, they ask, oops, sorry, carry on. Sorry, yeah, I, I guess what, what the question maybe is implying is, is could you sort of experimentally alter the fishing intensity and, and sort of go to the point where you start seeing some serious effects? Um, of course, the problem with that is that you're then overfishing. So it's probably not a point we would really want to go to. Yeah, so that kind of goes on to their question, which uh, their follow-up question, which was, if so, is there such a time scale sufficiently long enough to draw a meaningful conclusion related to the potential temporal or spatial changes from doing these kind of intensity trials or multiple trials? Yeah, I think I think that you've got to consider, you know, all the sorts of time scales from from rather short term responses to potentially longer term effects, and and that's why really, you know, you do need yeah, longer strategic programs of, of monitoring. Um, just looking at it for a few years probably isn't really going to be enough. Mm -hmm. That kind of builds onto the next question from Lucy. Uh, who submitted through Zoom, uh, which was what sort of program for monitoring short term and medium long, medium and long term effects on other infauna are in place as a part of the trial? Yeah, that's a, that's a, a good question. Um, there isn't any monitoring really of other infauna at the moment. And, and certainly that's something we want to investigate with with the DTP studentship at least in terms of getting some methodology in place that would allow us to do that mm -hmm. okay um the next question oh, we've got quite a few uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> how does variability in visibility affect the use of cameras for resource assessment imagine this could be a limiting factor in shallow soft sediment areas so a bit more about the methods of uh, yeah. how you're monitoring with your trials yeah so this was something we were quite concerned about early on when we were just sort of developing the methodology and it, it it's turned out to be much less of a problem than than we'd originally worried it might be the cameras are, are very close to the seabed so they're less than a meter above the seabed which really helps and you do get reduced visibility but really only if the tide is running quite strongly um also Maybe if there's been a storm or something like that, then, then the visibility won't be so good. But bear in mind that the razor clam fishing only really takes place in reasonably calm weather because of the technique. Uh, and so you wouldn't really go out and, and use this technique in, in sort of, you know, rough conditions. Yeah, I see. Um... And going back to that uh, interaction you saw with the Idas, uh, someone's asked what size of the razors were they feeding on, do you think? Were you able to kind of see that from the boat at all or yeah, from your videos? Yeah, to some extent. Um, we certainly, on the cameras, we, we've got we, some video of them kind of picking, picking them up. Sometimes they drop them again, though. Um, so it's not always guaranteed they're managing to pick them up. Um, but they, they seem to be able to swallow surprisingly large razors from, from what one could, could see. They, they seem to bring them up to the surface and then sort of flick their head back and, and sort of get them down like that on the surface. And sometimes you can see it can take them two or three head flicks to actually swallow the thing. Wow. So is that another another project there for, for someone, a seabird person, I think. <laughs> someone to stick in, yeah. Um, the next question was... Do you have an idea of what other sediment and fauna 
come to the surface when deploying this type of technique so not just the razor clams themselves yeah you don't it, it, you, you see very little uh, other stuff coming to the surface which initially again is, is slightly surprising but the experiments that were done by marine scotland in the tanks um showed that most of the other in fauna at least bivalve in fauna don't really seem to react to the stimulus by at least by coming to the surface whether they're reacting and going deep down that's a different question mm -hmm, mm -hmm. um so Going back to the very final uh, couple of slides that you were talking about in your talk, uh, given the current situation of closure and restrictions on global markets, do you have any interest or see any kind of movement to promoting the consumption of razor clams in the UK themselves? So I do know that there's been a couple of restaurants in, I think, Edinburgh, maybe in Glasgow, that have been taking some of the product from, from the fishery and trying to to get people a bit more interested in in it locally um yes it, it would i think it would be a, a a good i mean the whole seafood sector effectively in the uk is is currently asking that question mm. uh, and whether a stronger domestic market could give them more resilience when you you have something like this sort of global shock yeah, yeah. I, i've seen that myself like a lot of promotion for local local consumption as you mentioned um so our next question uh, also goes, uh, mentions the uh, IDAs, uh, predating on the razor clams in LIGO base. So appearance at the surface may increase uh, mortality for other reasons. Any studies in, on this aspect uh, with regards to the razor clams, any other pre predators, crabs, fish, and the percentage loss? Um, so on the videos, we've seen occasionally um, the odd shore crab apparently attacking um, a razor clam on the surface, but really infrequent observations. So too little really to, to estimate a percentage loss at the moment. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, and the next one's very short. Uh, what about the interstitial Special, yeah. Special organisms? <laughs> ho ho I actually don't know what that term means. <laughs> so any clarification about that would be really So easy. So all the other microfauna and myofauna um, existing in the in the sediment mm -hmm. um, yet no not a lot known about that um, again I think our DCP student is, is potentially going to be rather busy um, they have looked at some of that stuff in the southern North Sea for the for the pulstral fishery and again not really been able to show much response at all mm -hmm. um so uh, this question refers to when the trial was launched the cabinet secretary committed to undertake baseline surveys for the stock assessment on each area as soon as possible but the cabinet secretary did not give indication of how long that trial would last are you aware if even one of these areas uh, was used to gather that baseline data um, I, I guess the camera surveys are kind of the baseline data, but I, I see what you mean, and, and that's were they done before the electrofishing trials started? And I, I'm not aware of such data um, being gathered before the actual electrofishing trial started. However, I mean there are quite a few areas that have not been fished for quite a few years. And so there should be a scope to compare, you know, sort of uh, reference sites to areas that are being fished. But it's funding really that, that drives how much survey work can be done. Yeah, understood about that point. Uh, we have about five questions left. Are we okay for time, Clive, to just carry on through these last few that are remaining? Yeah. Yeah, if I, fall, fall, if I fall over due to lack of food at some <laughs> point, then... <laughs> <laughs> okay, great. Um, our next question is, what are the main environmental factors that drive the distribution of the razor clam itself? Yep, and is so, there research sorry. into the... Sorry, and is there research oh. into the possible implications of the electrolysis of the sediment? Okay, so first question, um, 
is that the main factor seems to be sediment type and depth. So the razor clams have been found down to about 40 meters depth, but by far the, the highest abundances are in, in shallower areas. Um, they're, they're definitely quite sediment specific. So Siliqua likes very sort of sandy sand, um, whereas Arcuatus is, is, or Magnus as it is now called, seems to be okay in slightly uh, coarser sediments. So sediment type and, and depth for sure. Um, there's also probably issues around food availability um, because certainly up around when we were doing the development trial in, in the Hebrides, there was a site we looked at which was very close to a causeway that had been built. And that seemed to be have a lot of dead uh, razor shells around mm -hmm. it. And, and the fishermen sort of felt that there used to be quite good um, densities of razor clams at that site, but it had changed when, when the causeway was built. So water circulation is, is probably a, an important factor. Um, electrolysis, yeah, it's been, it's been looked at. Um, you get more electrolytic effects with DC current, um, AC, because it's alternating from positive to negative cycling. Um, doesn't really seem to cause lasting or, or measurable electrolytic effects. Yeah. Um, is the fishery, in your opinion, sustainable in the long term, given the pos uh, given the paucity paucity yeah, yeah. stock <laughs> in recruitment centre? Sorry. <laughs> yeah, that's a very good question. Um, we don't really know a huge amount, I think, about the recruitment dynamics of, of razor clams. There's ideas that the, the small razor clams recruit to the outer parts of the, the beds and then sort of move in. Um, there's also possibilities that if you've got a, a dense bed of very old razor clams, it might inhibit recruitment to some extent. So perhaps a certain level of harvesting might even allow higher productivity, but that's that's a bit speculative. Um, it's very hard to say whether any fishery is really sustainable in the long term because it can always get hit by some unexpected recruitment failure. Um, but I, f I mean, I think it's got a chance that, that it it will be it will be sustainable as as long as the the effort is, is kept under control and, and managed. Mm -hmm. And moving, uh, moving on to that topic of management, um, going, uh, the next question refers to the video serving that you did. Um, so is there any work being done on investigating AI to detect the clams as opposed to that poor task of labeling and measuring by hand by whoever did that for, <laughs> for the trial? Um, and the person who asked the question also says, I presume that there is little chance of identifying the species on the basis of the images of the shell. Yeah, good, good point. Um, so I've been in some discussion with Mark James um, in, in, over at St. Andrews. So he's, he's trying to use some AI at the moment to try and measure scallop shells on, on similar video images. And we've, waiting to see really how that goes. Um, one, one of the problems I can see with the razor clam stuff though is that quite often if it's very dense you get shells overlying each other and my experience with this sort of image analysis stuff is it struggles to, to really cope when you've got overlapping images. Uh, and sort of separation of, of images is, is quite problematic. If everything's nicely separated, it, it would probably work quite well. Um, if you've got obscured parts of the image or overlapping stuff, I, I don't know, it might be more tricky, but it's, it's certainly something that would be interesting to, to try. <laughs> 
Mm -hmm. Right, we have a couple more questions left. So uh, the next question was, do you have any evidence as to whether the escape reaction of razors is due to the electric field directly or some kind of ionized molecule caused by the electric field? So a bit more of the biology of the actual razor gland itself. Yeah, so that again was something that was looked at by Fiona Murray and the movements of, of the clams after they've emerged seems to be essentially random. So there doesn't seem to be any sort of directionality caused by the electric field. Mm -hmm. And I guess if anyone um, wants to check out uh, that report itself, uh, they can just look back at your earlier slide that had all your references on it. Yeah, all, um, all, all of that stuff's public domain. That's good to know. Uh, and our last question says, uh, the IDAS can handle and swallow razor clams up to 100 millimeters, so 10 centimeters. And as Clive described, they can handle the razor clams at the surface. Oh, it's not actually a question. Uh, so where the IDAS lose many uh, to go through kleptoparatism. So uh, there, that's it. Thank you very much. That um, was a great Q&A session. You, yeah, and lots of questions about that. And for everyone, who is still with us right now. This whole session has been recorded and will be up on the MAS YouTube page. So if there are any slides or any answers that Clive discussed, it will be there uh, hopefully by the end of today. So that just leaves me to say thank you very much, Clive, for uh, your talk with us and um, plowing through the Q&A. <laughs> Yep, thank you very much for everyone listening. And my email address is on the last slide. If anyone thinks of something else that they, they want to ask, then, then drop me an email. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, thank you very much. And uh, everyone who's still with us should be able to see our um, upcoming talks. So please use the registration link um, that anyone has used before to join any of our previous webinars and you'll be able to join in on any of these upcoming talks as well. We are approaching uh, you know, August with our next availability. So if you want to give a talk, 29th of July is our next slot and just drop us an email uh, just saying that you would like to give it a go. So uh, thank you very much for everyone who's still with us. And again, thank you Clive.